Good evening, and welcome to the Václav Havel Library. This is Michal Žantovský on the Havel channel. A long time ago, when the world was still normal and consisted largely of revolutions and wars, rather than pandemics and climate changes, there were two revolutions in Europe that helped to change its face. One of them was the April uh, Revolution of 1974 in Portugal, the so-called Carnation Revolution. And the second one came 15 years later in Czechoslovakia and uh, was coined the term Velvet Revolution. And uh, tonight we will uh, reminisce on those days and on the interconnection and on how they are linked to the present and to the future. But first of all, uh, let me welcome our friends from Portugal, both in person and online, and most of all, His Excellency Luis de Almeida Sampaio, the Portuguese ambassador to the Czech Republic. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you. This meeting is taking place in the middle of the Portuguese presidency of the European Council, of the Council of the European Union, and one of the most difficult in recent history because of the pandemic crisis that has enveloped the whole continent and the world. As the COVID numbers went up and then down and up again and down again in both our countries, we were alternately sympathizing with, co-suffering with, and envying each other. But I suspect that at the most difficult moments, we both fell back on one indisputable verity. No matter how bad things are, we can always remember a time when they were worse. Both our countries attained a democratic present after long decades of hardship, tyranny, and instability. Both went through revolutionary moments of great hopes and expectations, and through the difficult transformations that followed. In this process, they were often informed and inspired by the experience and examples of the other country. As a direct participant in the events of the Velvet Revolution of 1989, I remember the first visit of a group of Portuguese students and activists who came to express their support for the revolution in December 1989, followed immediately by the visit of President Mario Soares, the first head of state, to visit the newly free Prague. And I went with President Václav Havel to Lisbon in the fall of 1990 and stood with him at the Cabo da Roca, although I was unable to save him from having his trousers splashed by the Atlantic Ocean. Since those days, we have met many times with our Portuguese friends in Prague and in Lisbon, revisited our memories, compared notes, exchanged experiences, and shared in our common European destiny. And we want to continue in this tradition tonight. First, I will ask my friend, Ambassador Sampaio, to lead a discussion on the revolutions then and now with some of those who were there at the time and some of those who came later. And then I will invite a group of Portuguese and Czech political thinkers and journalists to exchange their perspectives on the present and the post-pandemic future. I am sure we will enjoy the evening, and let me once again thank the ambassador for actually initiating this event, and to thank his guests for partnering with us. Uh, 
Please enjoy the evening, and Ambassador, the floor is now yours. Thank you, thank you very much for your very kind uh, words, uh, uh, my friend Ambassador Zentovsky and the Executive Director of the Václav Havel Library and the Foundation. Um, you said uh, very important things, and I think that your words set uh, very well the scenario for a very uh, interesting discussion. So let me start by welcoming you all, the public, a very broad audience that uh, we are having tonight. Let me also uh, thank our partners in this cycle of conferences, of which the event of uh, tonight uh, is part and parcel. As uh, uh, Ambassador Zentovsky just said, uh, this is uh, the exercise of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union in the Czech Republic, a very important uh, moment in time for a medium-sized European Union member nation like Portugal and the Czech Republic, very similar demographically, geographically, economically, with very different pasts, uh, but sharing the same European Union integration future. So thank you very much for what you said. I would uh, uh, also like to mention other partners that are with us tonight, the Institute for Politics and Society, the Forum 2000, the Europeum, and of course, the uh, European Commission representation in, uh, in Prague. So to all of them, that are supporting the uh, cycle of conferences that the Embassy of Portugal in Prague is putting together during these six months of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me also mention that uh, during tonight's debate, there is a documentary that is being broadcasted by live stream by uh, a very specialized uh, uh, Czech uh, uh, company, a documentary that is called Highway to Freedom, Avenida da Liberdade, where two of the participants of our first panel that I will introduce uh, in a couple of minutes uh, are also shown, they are also featured, featured in that documentary. Uh, Ambassador Zentovsky, uh, said already uh, a lot about the importance of the Portuguese Revolution back in 74, and then by late 89, the importance of the Czechoslovakian uh, Velvet Revolution. We will discuss that in different perspectives, with different approaches, but before I start the debate, let me introduce Sandra uh, Baborowska, uh, she is a remarkable lady. She is here with us uh, tonight. Uh, she is the curator of a very imposing uh, exhibition that took place some years ago called Carnation and uh, Velvet. But that exhibition will again take place in Portugal in 2022, uh, probably uh, remaked uh, with some new features. But I would like to ask uh, Sandra Baborowska uh, how she sees the immediate future, putting together this very important exhibition with all the difficulties and constraints of the pandemic related to COVID-19. Sandra, thank you very much. Uh, uh, their participation is a surprise also to two of the Portuguese participants because they know her very well. They did not know that she would be here with us tonight, so it is a special uh, uh, gift for José Pedro Guiabranco <laughs> and Álvaro Beleza. The floor is yours, dear Sandra Baborowska. Thank you for invitation, Mr. Ambassador. Um, yes, uh, I would like to um, say hello to my friends from Portugal, from Porto and Lisbon. Uh, now it's uh, two years. Uh, we uh, were here together in the library, and uh, the situation is uh, opposite. You were sitting here um, 
<laughs> too, and I was sitting there. Uh, so it's a really a pleasure uh, to mm, see us at least uh, like this, um, even do, uh, via Zoom. Uh, but uh, I feel your presence. <laughs> and um, uh, so let me um, introduce my exhibition I made with Adela Jinga, also from um, NAC Shiadu um, Museum from Lisbon, and also with uh, Pavel Sobe, uh, that was a uh, researcher, with uh, Ana de Almeida, that was artist and researcher also. Uh, we uh, developed the um, timeline uh, from 1968, uh, that uh, we um, realized for our exhibition really important date uh, for both countries, Czechoslovakia and Portugal. And then we tried to compare um, revolution, um, Kravush revolution, revolution incarnation from 1974 and our revolution 1989. Uh, as uh, we were preparing exhibition, we found out uh, the story that was uh, incredible for us, the story of roses. Um, so uh, a lot of symbols uh, we could uh, visualize on the timeline as uh, carnation, uh, roses, and the symbol of victory. Uh, that also connects us, uh, both countries. Uh, we would like to uh, repeat um, our uh, exhibition again, as you said, <coughs> in Lisbon in April. And also we would like to show uh, artworks from, from uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia and Portugal. Um, because we uh, presented for the first time here uh, Portuguese uh, art uh, for Czech audience that didn't know um, Portuguese art uh, because it's really long way from Portugal, um, even if with the flight it's short, but uh, with the artworks it's really a long way. So um, we would like to do the opposite, uh, bring um, Czech and Slovakian artworks to, to Lisbon again. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think that the distance, of course, matters, geography matters, but our cultural uh, links are so strong. It is one of the nice surprises I had um, after uh, having been appointed ambassador of Portugal to the Czech Republic is how strong the cultural links are. Um, it was also a surprise to me to know that uh, we have many Portuguese teachers uh, across the entire territory of the Czech Republic in every university teaching Portuguese language, history and culture with uh, uh, a great interest from the Czech uh, students. And um, that provides me an opportunity to mention that our next conference will take place on the 5th of May and it will be devoted to the, the strategic value of the Portuguese language. The 5th of May is the World Day of the Portuguese language and that will be the subject matter of our next uh, conference. Uh, now we are going to have a 30 seconds break. We will show on the screen the program of the conference of today, and we are immediately going to start the discussion of the first panel with very prominent guests. So see you in 30 seconds.
Back, uh, welcome back again to the conference uh, uh, from uh, uh, April to the Velvet uh, Revolution. Uh, we are here about to start the first uh, panel of our discussion tonight. We are going to have two Portuguese prominent personalities and two uh, Czech prominent personalities also. The two Portuguese personalities are uh, with us uh, uh, via video. They are in Porto and uh, Lisbon, respectively. And I have my Czech friends with me in the studio at the Václav Havel Library Foundation uh, uh, tonight. I will introduce them. Uh, first of all, only the names, José Pedro Aguiar Branco, uh, uh, Monica Paerova, uh, Álvaro Beleza and Ian Farsky. Uh, let me to, to, to try to set the tone for our debate, uh, to tell you that we are going to talk revolutions. And the term revolution has, as we all know, its origin in astrology and astronomy, but suffered a gradual politicization since the 17th century. And revolutions started to be seen as instances of radical social political transformations. Since the age of revolutions in the late 18th century, political philosophers and uh, theorists have aimed at defining what a revolutionary a revolution is. Thus, uh, the marked heterogeneity of the ways in which thinkers such as Thomas Paine, Condorcet, Kant, Hegel, Bakunin, Karl Marx, Anna Arendt, Michel Foucault, and others reflected on the possibilities and conditions of radically transforming political and social structures. In their works, the main questions pertain to the problems of what is new, of violence, of freedom, of the revolutionary subject, but also about the revolutionary object and of the temporal and spatial extensions of revolutions. Nevertheless, one thing all of those thinkers have in common. Revolution brings moments of irregularity, unpredictability, and uniqueness. But, my friends, don't be afraid. We are not going to discuss all those issues today. However, I would expect that uh, we will have the opportunity to discuss or to touch on some of those very important issues today. Now, uh, let me uh, turn myself to the first speaker of our first uh, panel, a good friend of mine, José Pedro Aguiar Branco, a very well-known Portuguese politician, a very well-known Portuguese lawyer. He was uh, Minister of Justice, and then Minister of National Defense, more recently. He is very well known in Portugal, but uh, who am I to tell you about uh, why he is so directly linked and connected to Prague, to the Czech Republic, and to the Velvet Revolution of uh, 1989? So, José Pedro Guiabranco, it is now up to you to tell us that story. Uh, thank you, um, Luis. I thank the ambassador Luis de Almeida, Sampaio and the Václav Havel Library for this invitation to participate in this session. And also a very special greeting uh, to Monica, uh, Alvaro and Jan. Um, well, it's an honor for me to be once again part of uh, history that binds Portugal and the Czech Republic 
in that which is most dear to human dignity, the affirmation of freedom. I was in Prague in October 1989 to distribute roses from Portugal. I was also 30 years later in the Václav Havel Library in April 2019 to give my testimony about the remarkable moments that unite us. And I'm now again among friends of freedom because in my point of view, this is a higher value that forces us to permanent mobilization to preserve it. In 1989, there was no internet. There was no mobile phone. There weren't therefore the social networks that uh, revolutionized the social sharing of information. Here in Portugal, there was a single television channel. There were physical boundaries between European countries. Moving between Portugal and Czech Republic required a prior visa. In other words, the circulation of information and people was slow, conditioned, and controlled. In 1989, affirming a strong, effective, visible, and consequent solidarity with the, the struggle for the liberation from the Soviet dictatorship obliged to physical presence, participation side by side, hand in hand with those in the streets, in schools or at work that fought for the establishment of democracy and freedom of choice according to the popular will. The same thing happened here in Portugal in 1974. Active, courageous and fearless participation of the lovers of the true freedom was decisive so that to a dictatorship of extreme right, it would not succeed. A communist dictatorship also placed in the sphere of Soviet power. We were militants of the cause of genuine freedom in the Portuguese revolution. I have no doubt about that. And it was this militant spirit that made me and some more young professionals fly then to Prague. So that in this way, we could let the young Czechs and the world know about the solidarity of Portugal. And who we were. We were presidents of associations of young professionals, lawyers, business, doctors, farmers, and architects to whom the then president of the Academic Association of Coimbra was joined. We were of different ideological influences and party affiliations or even without affiliation. Also all coming from what at time comprised the Socialist Party to the left and the Social Democratic Party to the right. To this extent, I from the Social Democratic Party and Alvaro from the Socialist Party symbolize the, this ideological feeling. The common and the highest point among us all was the greater value of freedom, which in 1974 also led us to streets to defend the democracy from all totalitarianisms. Our goal was to make people feel with our presence. And we were coming from a small country in a corner of Europe that the cries of freedom of the Czech uh, people were heard beyond its borders. 
that they were not alone, that their fight was not in vain. And uh, our aim was also to express with a rose, the great force of the perfume of freedom opposed to the oppressive force of the smell of the gunpowder. All this uh, in today's eyes is very romantic, but uh, at the time it was an interior explosive energy for our action. We lived unique and historical moments. Meeting at the headquarters of the Civic Forum with Václav Havel. The phone call between him and Mario Suárez. The distribution of thousands of roses from Portugal to thousands of Czechs that join us in St. Venceslao uh, Square. And uh, a very, a very a symbol, a very important uh, uh, gift that was the offer of the car with which Václav Havel took office as president. For history, Václav Havel was taken to its important mission as the first president in freedom in a car with a Portuguese plate. Well, uh, uh, Sandra Babarovska was there and I also uh, send a special greeting for, to it, to it, to her. And for you to know, feel and visualize best the common moments that mark our two revolutions, I uh, really invite you to visit the extraordinary exhibition organized by the Prague City Gallery and uh, the Art, the National Museum of Art Contemporary in Portugal that may be seen now in Portugal in the mouth of April as uh, it was already shown in Prague in April 2019. It is above all the fruit, and I, I must say that, of the competent and dedicated work of Sandra Babaroska, Adlai Jinga, Pavel Zobi, and Anna Almeida. They deserve our praise and applause. And uh, to finish, I would like to quote Miguel Vega, also a very a uh, friend of mine and uh, Louise and Alvaro, that uh, it was an illustrious lawyer, man of culture, and uh, also politis a politician from Oporto, who used to say, democracy is, a magnif is of a magnificent fragility that forces us to never take it for granted and oblige to the permanent and civic participation that uh, will defend it from the attacks of authoritarianism, from corruption, from lies, from dependence of the state, which limits and destroys freedom. And these threats are not outdated. We cannot forget, forget that. Today, as yesterday, they exist right and left. Surveillance and participation, for me, are essential tools in democracy. And my friends, we are using them in this session. For that, I congratulate again the Portuguese Embassy and my friend Luis Almeida Sampaio and the Václav Havel library thank you S thank you thank you very much you you see now after uh, hearing uh, uh, all these links between uh, uh, portugal and the czech republic uh, all these very personal uh, emotional but also very uh, politically rooted uh, links uh, how uh, i uh, repeat very often in my conversations, in my public uh, gatherings, uh, it is very easy to be ambassador of Portugal in Prague uh, because I know that I am very well 
supported by all these links, by all these uh, very important personalities that keep the ball rolling in what our bilateral uh, relations are concerned. Uh, now let me uh, turn the attention to uh, Monica uh, Paerova. Uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, Monica Paerova is a Czech activist, is a university teacher at the New York University Center in Prague, former diplomat, uh, student leader of the Velvet Revolution of 1989. And she is the chairwoman of the very well-known civic association Yes for Europe, an author and the presenter of the European Manual on Czech uh, Television. Uh, uh, Monica Payerova, before I give you the floor, let me show you and to all our audience the cover of the Time magazine issue of November 1990. So the cover of this special issue of Time magazine says, as you can see, Prague, the soul of Central Europe. So my question to Monica Payerova is, it, is it still the case? Is it that Prague is still the soul of Central Europe? The floor is yours. Thank you, Excellency. Hello to our Portuguese friends. It's a real pleasure to see you again. It's incredible what you can achieve with the online new technologies. Um, I'm really happy to see you. Uh, as said, uh, you were the first people who came from behind the Iron Curtain students to see us students in November 1989. And that is something that one can never forget. Although we see each other maybe once a year, we are like family to each other. So it's a real pleasure. Thank you for that. Um, yes, I think that Prague is maybe the heart of Europe. When I was spokesperson of foreign affairs, as you mentioned, uh, we had a magazine, we still have it actually, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs that is being sent to all embassies and Czech centers abroad, and it's called the Heart of Europe. Uh, we consider Prague and Czech Republic heart of Europe in the sense that because we are between the two big powers, Germany and Russia, we have been always on a crossroad of good influences, interesting meetings and friendships, but also horrible conflicts. And that's what I am teaching my university students. I hope that they are watching today. I told them who you are, so they know who they will be meeting. Um, they better be to work They much. better be, to I will be much. checking. <laughs> I not only teach foreign affairs and diplomacy, but also modern history. And when I say modern history, I mean communism and Nazism as two totalitarian regimes that started in a way that did not seem that dangerous at one point and that set on fire the whole Europe. And I am really glad that we speak here today in Václav Havel Library. I think he would be very happy to see us here. There is a beautiful photo of him that you cannot see, where he has this smirk of his, you know, when he was amused by something. Um, because as we are speaking, people are being beaten in Belarusia. Alexei Navalny may be dying in a so-called hospital in Russia. And there are people who are still hoping for freedom and democracy. So I really hope that today we will be not only speaking about what happened 30 years ago, but what do we Europeans have to do in common to defend the continent against everything that is not liberal democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica Payerova. Uh, very insightful and inspiring remarks of yours. And indeed, uh, what we are going to try to do uh, is a debate not only about uh, what happened uh, decades ago, but also about uh, uh, the circumstances we are living through, 
the challenges that we are all faced with within and outside the European Union, not only related to COVID, but also the economic, social, political challenges. Uh, and we will reflect on that, no doubt. Let me uh, give the floor now uh, to the second Portuguese participant of this panel, a personality that uh, also came to the Czech Republic, to Czechoslovakia at that time, to Prague in 1989. Uh, Alvaro Bleza is a very well-known Portuguese medical doctor, but he is also the uh, president of uh, one of the most prestigious uh, Portuguese uh, associations. Uh, SEDES is the Portuguese Association for uh, Economic and Social Development. Uh, is much more than a think tank. Uh, is really a landmark institution in the Portuguese political, economic and social uh, landscape. So, uh, Alvaro Beleza, and now for the introductory remarks, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. First of all, uh, th many thanks for your invitation and um, um, a special uh, kiss for Monica. Uh, we live together with Zé Pedro and our friends, one of the most um, touching moments of our lives. So we are friends for, together uh, uh, for our life. And um, to Zé Pedro, uh, to Oporto also, uh, to Sandra, uh, our uh, friend, she is an ambassador of Portugal in, in the Czech Republic. She loves uh, Portugal and the Portuguese culture and so on. And um, to the director of the Havel uh, Library, um, it is a pleasure to be with you today in a digital way, but we hope to come back again to Prague next time physically because we love Prague. We are, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I think we are a very lucky guys, um, me and Zé Pedro, because we live the two um, beautiful revolutions the Portuguese revolution in 74. We, we had uh, in that time 16 years and um, we lived uh, um, the end of uh, a fascist dictatorship, but also we had uh, um, a menace of a communist dictatorship in 75. And the Mari Suarez, the, in that time, the leader of Socialist Party was the leader of uh, uh, a resistance to that uh, way. And uh, it was not by hazard that uh, Marie Suarez, as a socialist, but knew also the, the dangers of a communist dictatorship. He was so uh, friendly with the, the, um, the hand of the uh, communist dictatorship in the East and the Central Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we live that uh, revolution, so we understand w when we were uh, young that uh, uh, fascists or communists are dictatorships are all bad because we have no freedom, we are not uh, happy, uh, people uh, are so focused, and uh, so when the, and after we lived with you uh, another revolution. Uh, always with fun, uh, with energy, with color, and uh, we saw in the Czech's eyes uh, what is freedom. And uh, so it's um, uh, like Monica said, I, I, I want to speak about the future because I think that now Europe, we have um, 30 years past, we have uh, many challenges uh, ahead. We have still Russia, a problem. Russia don't uh, live well with uh, um, liberalism and uh, democracies, uh, liberal democracies, and so they are uh, still a problem. We have uh, countries like uh, Belarus and Russia itself and uh, uh, neighbors that have problems. So I think uh, now speaking about policies, that our alliance with the, the Americans, with the United States, NATO, is very important 
for Europe, um, still today. Uh, and uh, I think also that we are now with the European Union. We have no frontiers. I came to Prague uh, two years ago by car with no frontiers. I did. I only stopped uh, once uh, to take a coffee in the frontier, but no problem. We have a Europe of no frontiers, uh, more developed, uh, better, much better than it was uh, 30 years ago. But Europe in this uh, pandemic uh, a crisis that we are still in, but I think, I hope, as a doctor, that we are in a way out now. Uh, but Europe uh, had some fragilities in the health uh, uh, organization, uh, in uh, the pharmacological industry of Europe, and uh, we must work to fix it. Um, and I think also that uh, in a political way of thinking Europe uh, must uh, uh, have uh, reforms because revolutions are nice when they end well and our two revolutions they ended well but several times there are revolutions that are very um, with uh, blood and uh, and sometimes they, they don't end well um, so uh, it's better that we can reform uh, and uh, Europe must be reformed, more uh, united, more um, uh, um, strong uh, uh, in the values of uh, uh, liberal values, social values. Sedesh, uh, that I am now the leader, is an association, I think, thank, uh, what it was created before the revolution of 74, in 70s, by young Portuguese uh, guys like uh, the actual, uh, the uh, Antonio Guterres, that is now Secretary General of the United Nations, and our president, Marcelo Rebelo Sousa, of the party of Zé Pedro and his friend. Um, and um, we are social and liberal. We, we defend uh, liberalism with uh, uh, a social um, help uh, for the people and uh, no one must be uh, uh, outside uh, uh, and uh, with the state must care of the people that they have no health, no education, no money. So Europe is, is that. Europe is a social democrat and a liberal uh, place to be. And uh, like Monica said, we have several uh, problems ahead. So, Monica, if it's needed, I told uh, Sandra uh, some months ago, we go to Belarus. It's, uh, we are still age for going there. We are with uh, white hairs, but not so old. But uh, Europe needs um, to be strong. And I want to leave this, um, this thing. Um, it's, uh, we are, I, I, I think, and Zé Pedro, and, all the, the Portuguese that went uh, there to, to Prague, we are all Europeans and we like uh, European Union and so on. But uh, I think that we have two, two challenges now, Russia and China. And uh, Europe must uh, always be together with the oldest republic, liberal republic of the world, um, almost with the 250 years. It's the United States of America. And now they have a president that it's a normal guy, liberal guy, and a, a social liberal guy. And I think that Europe must uh, work together with them because uh, with Australia, New Zealand, we are the democracies, we are the, um, a light to the world. And um, we must always uh, be work on that. Uh, to the last but not the least, we are also lucky because we live in the Portugal and Czech Republic. We have the most beautiful cities of Europe. Prague, Lisbon, Oporto. We are so beautiful because beautiful, beauty is culture, is aesthetic, is philosophy, is music. It's not by hazard that uh, Prague is so beautiful. It's because the people like uh, art, like culture, um, we also are a people of uh, writers, poets, and like Havel, 
um, and the swars also they they love to write and they are sensitive people so um like Havo, like it very much the heart is uh, is our is our symbol also thank you thank you very much uh, alvar beleza i will i will pick up exactly where you left this very last bit of your intervention uh, i will come back during our discussion to the important references you made to the transatlantic relationship uh, to the never-ending challenges worldwide <clears throat> on a global sphere uh, to freedom and to our democracies you mentioned and very well so russia china uh, and so thank you very much for those very important uh, uh, thoughtful uh, highlights. But you, uh, uh, at the final portion of your intervention, you said that uh, we are very lucky, we live in countries with uh, uh, astounding, beautiful uh, cities, Prague, Lisbon, or Porto, of course. And I always say, and I am picking up with that note, I always remind my interlocutors that I am not only the ambassador of Portugal in Prague, but also the ambassador of Portugal to the Czech Republic. And that is very important because the Czech Republic is not only Prague. And we have with us tonight, as a reminder of exactly that, uh, a man that uh, uh, was uh, leader of the mayors for Liberec's region. Probably the Portuguese audience, uh, they don't know almost uh, I would not say uh, all of them, but very few uh, would uh, know about Liberets. Uh, but it is a very beautiful city. I, I can uh, testimony that it is a very beautiful city, as Ostrava, Brno, Olomouc, and other extraordinary uh, cities of uh, the beautiful uh, Czech Republic that I have the opportunity to visit and to engage with uh, interlocutors, students, politicians, artists, and businessmen in all those regions, in spite of the difficulties we are faced with, with the COVID-19 uh, related uh, pandemic. But we have with us uh, Ian Farsky. Uh, he is a, a politician, a prominent Czech politician from uh, the Stan political party, the party that represents the mayors and independents. And it is a very important uh, political composition in the party landscape of the Czech Republic. Now that uh, elections are approaching, slowly but steadily, and that uh, the Stan is bound to play an even a more active and important role. But uh, we are not here tonight to speak about the intricacies of the Czech political situation, even though that is a very important uh, and topical issue and very uh, dear to my heart, professionally, as you can imagine. But let's uh, come back to the revolutions. What, uh, from uh, your party standpoint, from Liberets, uh, what is your impression, your view, your perception about uh, the achievements of the Czech Velvet Revolution. And if you think that uh, there is something that you owe to the Portuguese Democratic Revolution that triggered the third wave of revolutions and that took place back in April 74. Ian, please, the floor is yours. Yeah. First of all, thank you for the invitation for this wonderful meeting. It's great to see you in, in Portugal and it's great to sit here with you on this stage. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you, uh, Václav Havel Library. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from the uh, region that uh, can be seen as a, as a frontiers of the country because uh, it's about 120 kilometers from Prague, north, and uh, I uh, see that uh, 
so many improvements happen not only in the society but uh, as well uh, in the in the towns uh, all the, all the infrastructure was rebuilt the people are meeting more than ever before the uh, the society is growing and it's great that you can see the changes everywhere the improvements are incredible i think that the last 30 years are the best years of this country ever because uh, uh, so many things were improved. But every, every time there's a but. But uh, as the changes uh, were really fast uh, and uh, society and some people weren't prepared for the changes, we left a lot of people behind, let's say. And uh, I'm meeting there, especially in these regions, you can see the people that are tired of the democracy, of the freedom. They see that uh, uh, they, they don't see the improvements on their life. They, they just see the threats. They see the, uh, that, that other people are enjoying the freedom uh, much more than they are. And somehow they, they uh, were used to live in a simple world because the totalism is quite a simple word for many people and uh, this complex word is something that is threatening them and uh, that's my political aim and that's uh, something i'm really looking at and i'm trying to help these people that we left behind uh, it's not political wise because they are not uh, voting they are not attending any uh, any um, uh, elections uh, they but i think that they are important for the future of this country because they will vote their children will vote and uh, they will they can change the path uh, we uh, we are on for 30 uh, for 30 years so uh, I think it's necessary to help them and th there are, I think, about, let's say, about one million people in this country that can be uh, uh, said that were left behind. Okay. So that's, that's my aim and I think that we, we have to focus on them. Okay, Jan Feisky, thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the comments. And, and it is uh, very interesting what you just said uh, reflecting on the importance of uh, leaving no one behind. Uh, recently, I had the opportunity to give an interview to one of your uh, uh, newspapers, one of uh, the best known uh, uh, Czech daily newspapers. And one of the questions I was asked was exactly about the consequences of the pandemic. Is the world after the pandemic be exactly the same uh, as it was before? I don't know. I think that nobody uh, really is entitled to say that we are going to live in a different world. But what I believe is that we should profit from uh, the consequences of the pandemic to decrease and not to enlarge gaps, mm -hmm. generation gaps, solidarity gaps. Of course, the need for uh, totally, total rethinking of our health structures. And Alvar Bleza, as a medical doctor, knows uh, much better than the vast majority of us uh, what I am uh, uh, talking about. So it is very important that in that future, mm -hmm. post-pandemic future, no one is left behind. Thank you very much for that. I am now going to make a very brief reflection to open the floor. And you will pick up the floor as you will. I am not going to give you the floor to Monica or to Jan, Jose Pedro and Alvar. Uh, let me only try to, to, to inject some challenge uh, on our debate. Uh, Jose Pedro Guiabranco said that uh, uh, one of the most important things of his personal experience, the feeling that we are not alone. Both Czech and Portuguese and across the board in Europe, we are not alone. And I think that the European Union and the European project is all about that, about being part of the family. 
And uh, the fact that the Czech Republic, as well as other countries in Central Europe, came back to the family at a certain point during their European Union or European communities at that time integration process. This sense of cohesion. And my question would be, um, is this sense of cohesion lost or it remains? Then Alvar Bleza mentioned the importance of the transatlantic relationship. It is key. The transatlantic relationship is not about uh, defense and security only. It is also, and a very important dimension is defense and security. The deepening of the European Union of Defense is not a replacement for NATO and for the transatlantic relationship. But the transatlantic relationship is also, or should be also about values, shared values. And that is also a very important reflection that I would like you all to engage. Then Monica uh, uh, mentioned, we the Czechs, we the Czech Republic, we are in the middle of Europe, a little bit squeezed between Germany and Russia. It is a very interesting uh, thinking. I was ambassador to Germany, and I firmly believe that uh, even from an almost scatological viewpoint, the Germans know that their future lies in Europe in the European Union, uh, really in the heart of Europe. And that is also a very important uh, reflection for our, uh, for our debate. The last 30 years were the best of our lives, the improvements, uh, the best ever. Um, it is still the case, the present and the future hold also that promise. So with these very simple reflections, uh, please jump on the debate, uh, don't, uh, don't hesitate, uh, and uh, start uh, as you will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please. Can I? Uh, I will start where Jan finished, because uh, for me it's a real pleasure to see that after the first generation of people who did the revolution in our 20s, uh, there is a new generation of younger people than us who uh, understand the importance of freedom and democracy and they understand that politics cannot be only made in capital cities, however beautiful Prague or Lisbon or Paris or London are, but that uh, actually politics has to be made in the regions and in towns and villages. I myself am, by a coincidence, from the same region as Jan Farsky. I am from the Sudetenland. It's the border because uh, between Czech Republic and Germany. I am from a little village next to Děčín. And so uh, the house where I was born belonged to German people who were expulsed from that village in a very brutal way. And I wrote a book about it because... And there is a movie, as you know, a very recent movie yes, about that. Very there is a movie, movie called Landscape uh, in a Shade. And I strongly recommend it. It's really probably the best film of last year. We will send, Landscape you, the, in we will the shade. send you the correct information. It's about that whole Sudeten region that was... Um, 50, 60 percent German in between 1918 and 1938, and that Hitler and his NSDAP basically misused this German minority as a fifth cologne in the same way that Vladimir Putin does it now in Ukraine with Ukraine, yeah, absolutely East Ukrainians, or in Belarus with Russians, or in the Baltic states with the Russian minority. These minorities can be misused in an incredible way because they are usually simple people, farmers, living in small areas with very little connection to the headquarters, to the capitals. And when somebody tells them your life could be better if only you joined this party, then they join the... National Socialist Party in 1938, or they joined the Communist Party uh, 10 years later. So I am very happy that uh, there is a new generation of Czech politicians who understand this, that the, the social contract 
and the contract about solidarity cannot be made only between capital cities in European oh, of Union. Course. And that we need a public uh, popular consensus for that. And if we don't make that, and that's my last sentence, the populists will use it. If we liberal Democrats will not make it, then there is always somebody who can use this populistic exactly. rhetorics. Exactly. That means, Monica, in my point of view, that we must uh, reinforce the um, European citizenship. Um, uh, I totally agree uh, when uh, uh, you said that uh, last 30 years uh, were the best for everybody, for the Czech Republic, for uh, here in Portugal, Spain, Italy, so on. But uh, in my point of view, we were a little intellectually arrogant because we thought that everything was uh, done by granted and uh, that uh, in our generation, we, we, we wouldn't suffer uh, bad things as others uh, uh, a long time ago suffered. And uh, that uh, pandemic uh, shows, uh, in my point of view, important things. Um, uh, I'm sure that we, it was better not to have the pandemic, but uh, we, cannot, uh, 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 we cannot impeach that then. That means that for internal uh, our internal problems uh, and also for our position in uh, uh, the world uh, shows that we must increase, reinforce our European project, not only in an econ economic way, but uh, in uh, that spirit of citizen that uh, uh, mm. shows that uh, each one of us is an European yeah with certain uh, values that are together for us. Uh, um, and I, I think that uh, the only way uh, to overcome the threats that are global threats, military, uh, climatic, and so on, there are global threats, pandemic, it's an example, we must reinforce our uh, uh, European project. I know that we have a lot of difficult difficulties, but those difficulties are much higher without a common project. It's uh, we cannot forget that, and we, uh, if we are intelligent people, uh, I think it's the moment. Uh, even if it's very difficult, because uh, the wind, uh, it's. Uh, 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 suffering, uh, in other way, uh, but uh, it's in those moments uh, that also it's very important to participate, to be present, to, to, Zé... to say exactly what is. Uh, uh, Zé Pedro, Sim. I think in, in the end of the day. The problem is, like Jan said, no one must uh, stay behind. So how can we resolve this? I think that's the challenge of Europe. We have to have uh, um, uh, economic growth to uh, people that uh, are outside it. Uh, the populism in the United States and Europe has always, in Russia, in, in Germany, with Hitler, he has always the same... Uh, um, how can I say? Um, uh, cause is 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 is, is an employment uh, um, industries that uh, went uh, down and so on. I think that now that we are uh, in a challenge of uh, economic development with uh, digital, green agriculture, um, we have also a challenge in Europe. Uh, uh, of industry that went to Pakistan, uh, China, and so on. So we, we have to think, to have a vision uh, in Europe. Our leaders must think about it and, and act. Uh, we have um, big challenges 
to respond to that and to the people uh, that Ian uh, spoke. We have the same in Portugal, in Spain, everywhere. Uh, people outside the big cities, outside the universities, the big uh, uh, companies, uh, Deloitte and, uh, and uh, Microsoft and so on. No, it's not everybody like that. So uh, we have to respond to those people. And uh, if we have economic development uh, for everyone, not only for someone, and now we have a a problem in the global capitalism that uh, the, the concentration of money in a few people is a, a capitalism, feudalism uh, capitalism in a, a global way. We have uh, all this global problem. It's not only a Czech problem. It's, it's our uh, uh, society. is a problem of, for our children. Uh, and so it's uh, like Monica said, we have to have a new idea, ideal, that uh, politics must be on service of ideas, of romantic ideas, that our uh, dreams that can move with our energy and will, but we have to have ideas um, and, um, and a new deal, uh, a new social deal and political deal. But I think the, 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 the big idea is very old. Europe must always defend individual liberties and solidarity for that respect for everyone. Equality, we are we born all equal, so we must be respected and don't uh, take no one behind. Uh, that's a very important uh, uh, phrase, uh, a very important um, Slogan must be a very important slogan for all like people. We there, must respect, yeah. respect and help the, the others that need more uh, help. Yeah, thank you for Always. these ideas. I, I think that, uh, and I'm, I'm almost sure that every crisis is a chance for, for uh, improvements or worsening. And uh, we are, as Europeans now here, and I think that uh, we we have uh, no choice choice but cooperate, because the world yeah. is uh, uh, too big for a small European states. We have to keep the Europe together. And from my perspective, I think that we are through this crisis uh, on a crossroad. Somehow, to improve the cooperation, to deepen the connection and to go to the federalization mm -hmm. or to weaken the connections and go to go to splits. Yeah. I think that we have only two choices. There's nothing in the middle. Uh, so uh, this crisis is also a possibility for a stronger Europe. And I hope that uh, it's going to happen. But we need the strong leaders and the Europe is not, uh, and its institutions and its treaties are not made for choosing the strongest leaders uh, uh, for the leaders of the European Union. They still are totally in, in the States. Yeah. So we should change this. And uh, being yeah. in this library, uh, wonderful speeches of uh, Mr. Havel in 90s. He was speaking about it. And uh, it's so inspiring. I recommend it to everyone because he he really had a wonderful vision of Europe. Thank you we very much, uh, Jan. And we need a breath of revolution. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. We are uh, we are running out of time, which is always the case with uh, very interesting debates and discussions. Uh, I I I was. Um, uh, underline some uh, very important takeaways of our debate. I think that uh, uh, we talked about the future of Europe. Will it be a more integrated, even a federal future, or a more loose kind of arrangement between uh, nation states? Very important challenge, but at the end of the day, the idea that uh, Europe is our common destiny and our final destination. 
in that in that sense it is also very important to uh, understand the importance of the social dimension and uh, the combination of the social dimension with economic growth we all know that we are faced with unprecedented challenges i am not going to name names of countries i am not going to leave my uh, uh, costume as a, an ambassador but i will still say that for the first time in history we are probably faced with very successful economic models that are not sustained by liberal democracies. To the contrary, extremely successful and very challenging in global terms economic models that are sustained by very autocratic regimes. And that is a big challenge because we used to think about uh, this uh, equation or this uh, um, uh, identicality between liberal democracies and economic growth and social development mm -hmm. and uh, well-being and welfare states. And we run the risk of losing part of the perspective if we don't really take care about uh, other very important dimensions that are encompassed on the so-called triad of uh, adversary, opportunity, or partner. Um, it was a very interesting debate. I, I learned a lot. I have to thank you very much for your presence. I think that uh, uh, this was uh, one of the brightest moments of the cycle of conferences that the Portuguese presidency of the European Union in Prague is putting together. Uh, and thank you really very much, both of you in uh, the studio and José Pedro Guiabranco and Alvor Bleza in Porto or Porto and Lisbon, respectively. We are now going to have a technical break. We are going to present the introduction of a documentary, a documentary film prepared by uh, uh, a Portuguese uh, artist that you will hear about him during the 15-minute break. The documentary is called Highway to Freedom and I think is the perfect combination to the debate we are having today. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
tarde, uh, dobrý den, apesar de eu ser português, uh, e que diz Blubin Chesky, today the language official for this conference is uh, English, so we're going to speak in English. My name is Antonio Pedro Nobre, my name is Emanuel Ruggiero, and we are the authors of the film Autostrada da Liberdade, or in Czech, Dalnice Svobodu, in English will be something like Highway to Freedom. And this is a short documentary that we did uh, together, and uh, the idea came uh, a few years ago, here in Brno, at a cafe called Mezzanine. It's a cafe that is very lusophile, it has a lot of things related to Portugal, and there was on the walls an exhibition uh, about an event called 50,000 Roses for the Velvet Revolution, about a group of Portuguese young people a delegation of Portuguese young people who came to support the Velvet Revolution while it was going on and distribute 50,000 roses over the people. Uh, back then, because I am Portuguese and I live in Czech Republic since 2005, um, I always wanted to do something that connected both the country where I was born and the country that I live in, and I saw this as a great opportunity. And since we have been partnering as a filmmaker since 2014 or something, um, we decided it could be a good project to do. And meanwhile, um, in 2019, I get an invitation because we had this project, but we had other things going on, so we're not like planning to do it. But all of a sudden, we got the invitation for uh, the opening of the exhibition, Kravos e Vlud, that was dedicated to both the revolutions, the Portuguese Revolution and the Czech Revolution, that have a lot in, in common, as you might be already discussing today, and you will see also in our film, and um, also about this visit of this group of Portuguese that came to support the revolution. And uh, when I knew that they were coming, I thought, okay, this is a great chance to, to have them uh, and in Prague and film them in Prague. But there was one handicap. Both me and Emmanuel were not available to, to film them because we were about to leave. And, uh, I could still meet uh, uh, Alvaro Bleza and José Viegas. They still came one day before I left. The rest of the, of the group came on the day that we were already out of the, the country. And so I still managed to arrange to have a cameraman with them and film them while they were in Prague. And we, we decided that I will interview them in Portugal later on because I, I go frequently to Portugal. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, by a technical reason, our cameraman, um, when he sent us the material, the material came damaged. Uh, when we downloaded, not all the images were opening in the editing facility. Uh, so, and when I asked him to resend them, he said, oh, I thought you read them, so I erased them. So we lost the footage that, uh, a lot of the footage that uh, was filmed by our colleague in uh, Prague with the group. I was about to quit the project, uh, meanwhile I, I learned that the Portuguese television was doing a similar documentary as well, but um, Alvaro Bleza encouraged me to keep doing it, and he said, it's not a problem, I'm going back to Prague in December, along with uh, José Pedro, and you can film the two of us in Prague again, and you can do the project still. So me and Emanuel came in December, we filmed them, and this is the result. A short documentary, 17 minutes, that you can watch on their films. And uh, we hope uh, when the situation of the pandemic will uh, be better to be able to show it in universities and in schools all over Czech Republic. So enjoy it, I guess. Anything else to say? Since we, we are here, since I was here, since I came here seven years ago and you were almost 15, we always been uh, interested in uh, great history or history, but the history told by real testimonies. So this is the thing that uh, allowed us to go on with our projects. So, so we are very happy to have done this one. Okay, so enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you for having us. Bye.
Well, good evening again. Uh, we will continue with uh, our conference from April to the Velvet Revolution, organized by the Václav Havel Library together with the uh, local Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union. And uh, uh, we have with us, uh, not right now, but in the room we have the ambassador of Portugal in Prague, uh, my uh, friend Sampao. And uh, uh, we will move to the second panel and there has to be a bridge between the first and the second panel. And uh, I have some surprise for the ambassador. We are planning uh, with our friends in the DOC's uh, exhibition center and the Amnesty for Art, a branch of Amnesty International. We are planning to unveil a huge mural in Prague, outdoors, uh, to celebrate <coughs> the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution of 1989, uh, designed by a leading Czech graphic artist, Peter Sees, who lives yeah. in New York. And it will be a 70 meter long mural depicting the modern Czech history from Masaryk to Havel, from the independence to the Velvet Revolution, and the technology of the mural is azulejos. It's a traditional <laughs> Portuguese ceramics that... Yeah. <laughs> and I've seen the mural. I mean, it's still in the tiles, in the individual parts, and it's beautiful, so I hope that you will uh, Mr. Ambassador, accept our invitation to uh, attend the uh, unveiling. But uh, now to the present and the future. We'll be discussing the post-pandemic future with our guests from Portugal. Uh, they are Jaime Nogueira Pinto, professor in the Institute of Political and Social Sciences at the Lisbon University. Thank you for joining us, Professor. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. And Jose Manuel Fernandez, journalist and publisher of The Observador, a magazine in uh, Portugal. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hello. And we have, I think, two very matching uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's a for me. That's I, will, I will start with the lady. We are still old-fashioned here. Uh, Hopefully. Lenka Zlamalová is a leading journalist for the Echo 24 uh, magazine. Uh, it's, uh, she's, uh, she has very strong views and <laughs> Uh, most politicians in this country know that it's worse to be on good terms with uh, Lenka Zlamalová. And last but not least, uh, Tomáš Sedláček is uh, an economist, an author, a social scientist. Uh, he is an economist at the ČSOB, the Czechoslovak Trade Bank, and uh, he's also a uh, lecture at the Metropolitan University in Prague. So this is the deal. And now come the questions. I mean, how did Europe fare in the crisis? That's the starting point of any discussion today. Is it glass half full? Is it glass half empty? Uh, uh, heavy coped? Uh, how well did we cope with the vaccination process? Uh, uh, how strong is the financial package that the European Union has uh, uh, proposed? Uh, how are we handling the diplomacy of COVID vis-a-vis uh, -vis the big pharma uh, Britain, Russia, uh, the United States. So 
uh, what, what marks would you give us? It's, uh, and we will start with our, uh, with our guests from, from Portugal. So, Professor, would you like to be the first? Well, I can start. I think I'm the older one, so <laughs> I can start. Uh, well, I think the, the management of the crisis has not been very brilliant. Let's, let's see. It's, uh, it has been uh, fragmented. It has been uh, polemical. It has been, as you, you look, for example, at va vaccination, you see that uh, both the United Kingdom and the uh, United States are much more advanced in terms of uh, proportion of population vaccinated. And, uh, well, I don't know what is going to happen with the financial sector, but looking at the past, and I think the, the parallel we have to raise now is the parallel with the, the, the Great Depression in the, in the late 20s and early 50, 30s, and I think we have to, in some sense, to, to do what has been done at that time, is, is, is to put the, the machine of cash working. And uh, because otherwise we are going to, we see here in Portugal, for example, it's the, the situation is, is, is extremely, extremely serious because we, 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 we see a lot of uh, little business, small business being bankrupted and nobody is doing nothing for that. And we are afraid that when the money comes, it will be used in uh, big projects and, uh, well, the real economy that at the end of the day goes with, with all this small business, medium-sized business, all these people will be left out. And uh, so in my, in my sense, I have a, a relatively, well, of course, on the other side, I guess on the other side, there's always a, a kind of totalitarian temptation in these times. And, uh, uh, but uh, governments, well, try to do things that nobody asks them to do. And for example, we hear now things that I think will be awful. For example, again, we heard about this uh, famous request of Professor Rogoff three or four years ago about suppression of cash. Uh, and I think all these things, we have to be extremely cautious with that because uh, no doubt that uh, cash favors things like uh, organized crime, like uh, uh, drug uh, mafias, all that sort of things. But today you suppress cash, you have suppressed, I think, a basic element of our freedom. The day governments or central banks or banks will have the control of all the economic or financial movements of people. I think it's, it's worse than, than any, any totalitarian dystopia. It's very curious that I haven't seen, I'm, a, I'm a, a fan of dystopian literature and I not, never saw one about exactly that, suppression of cash in a, in a dystopia. And, uh, but I, I think there are some, some people talking about that and uh, that's one of the, well, that's one of the dangers, I think, on the, on the side of, of control, I think is one of the dangers that could be faced in the after pandemics solutions. All right, thank you. We will take turns between Lisbon and Prague. Uh, so Lenka, would you like to? Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, uh, I am convinced that Europe uh, made uh, worse results from the whole civilized world uh, in this crisis. Uh, I would say that uh, in many terms, uh, uh, logistic, uh, trust, uh, resilience, and all these abilities which uh, were very important in this crisis, and also ability to risk taking, and uh, logistic uh, organization of things in all those terms 
uh, Europe is on the last place in the whole civilized world. There is a really nice, uh, let's say, ranking uh, by Bloomberg agency called uh, Best and Worst Places uh, Where to Be During uh, Pandemics. And there is a lot of measures from um, mobility, uh, uh, number of deaths, number of infection, uh, number of uh, business interruptions, school closing, and, and the other th things. If you are like, looking on this uh, scoreboard, on the first places are, of course, East Asian countries. There is a, um, um, only a couple of uh, victims. There were schools whole time open. Uh, mobility um, was not interrupted for a long time. And on other other side of this spectrum are European countries. Unfortunately, Czech Republic is one of worst. Uh, somewhere, somewhere in between are United States. There are big differences uh, between states in US. Uh, but uh, I am asking myself why Europe uh, uh, made uh, such a bad results. And I think that uh, there is a lot of problems. Uh, one, of, one of them is um, how to say how to say it. Uh, all these all these values of uh, technological uh, organizational skills, logistics, and uh, risk-taking skills are uh, going down in a long time in Europe because uh, for uh, us. Um, Secure, security and this kind of calm living, uh, not uh, any sharp uh, um, exercise and this kind of stuff. That's, it was uh, Europe uh, before, uh, before this crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, usually in those crises, um, weak uh, making uh, weakest even, and strong uh, making uh, uh, strongest. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, it's European position. We are seeing uh, these results in uh, any, med any measures, basically. And vaccination, last, uh, last time, is one of, one of them. There is a lot of reason why, uh, why Europe uh, has a really shortage of vaccine. And I think that uh, some kind of uh, strategic thinking, uh, risk taking in purchasing uh, th those vaccines, and also some uh, financing uh, of research and development in pharmacy, pharmacy and medical stuff are other reasons. I am myself uh, deeply surprised that, for example, Germany is a very advanced uh, industrial country with good organization and technological skills is uh, on the such a bad uh, shape in vaccination. There are not uh, those big drive-in and vaccination centers and uh, really uh, superior logistics, for example, in Great Britain and in Israel. I think that some bureaucratic kind of European thinking is one of the reasons why Europe made such a better results in this crisis. Oh, well, that was quite strong, as I warned <laughs> beforehand. Uh, so, Mr. Fernandez, would you agree with that? I mostly agree with it. I mostly <laughs> agree with it. Uh, uh, I should say that uh, Europe has not done a, a very good job. And uh, sometimes I think would uh, each country of Europe, if uh, they would uh, act alone, do a better job? Which is a very disturbing question in these moments. We are from medium countries in Europe. that are smaller and bigger than uh, Portugal and the uh, Czech Republic. And uh, from the point of view of Portugal, we say, oh, for us, it would be very, very difficult, for instance, to have good... Uh, vaccination, if you don't have the help of the European Union, you don't have money, if you don't have the help of the European Union. But at the same time, uh, as we see the way the European Union has managed the, 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 the crisis, we feel that there are a kind uh, of um, uh, way of working that has a lot of problems. 
I, th I think one of them the, you have talked is they are risk averse. They don't take Europe don't like to take risks. Uh, it's very very interesting to see it and to compare the way uh, the, the 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 United States and the United Kingdom has take the problem of the the the, the vaccines, the, the vaccination program, and Europe has taken away. Uh, it's it's so it's a huge difference huge difference the the the, the they 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 make a bet they imply uh, 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 capital they in the in the states they 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 call a general to make logistical approach they build factories from nothing from the ground to 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 have uh, the, the, the vaccines at, at, at time, they made all this kind of operation with one of the vaccines, the, 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 the creators of the vaccines, they are Germans, mm -hmm. and they make all the logistics, all the, 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 the thing in the, in the United States. So they could make all those things with the Trump administration, because all those things began with the Trump administration, it was not done in the last two months. It was a year work. Uh, and in those times, the European Union was uh, discussing the price of the vaccine, which is a bureaucratic approach, which leaves me with another question. Another question is uh, the problem of... Uh, the account accountability of the European Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do as European citizens to with the, the European Commission and the European Council to say we are we, we didn't we didn't uh, we, do, we don't like the work we have done. We, we, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. We, we can say to our prime ministers or uh, to 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 go to the European Council to make something, but you can literally do nothing, almost nothing, uh, because uh, we know the, the 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 democratic mechanisms of the European Union are not really democratic, and they are not uh, really accountability accountability of those mechanisms. So. At the same time, when we think also of the all the fiscal mechanisms that were uh, imagined for this crisis, I think they they came short of the American the United Kingdom again, again, and they in in this moment they are not still in place. We are still waiting of all the way to go. We are still waiting for some parliaments to approve it. We are still waiting for the Postnow court in Germany to approve it. So all this machine is very, very hard to move. So we have to find, I think we have to find some ways to make uh, uh, this work another uh, the, uh, another way. I don't see. I don't think it's easy because really this is a very a very uh, Frankenstein construction. <laughs> so it's very difficult to make it work in a way that uh, that can uh, can really works. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, Tomas, what is your report card for, for Europe? Yeah, well, it has been very kafka I think, in uh, <laughs> sort of a European tradition. But let me also remind you that it's a little bit of a merry-go-round. I mean, a couple of months ago, it was the United States of America that, that uh, took the least uh, safe um, approach. And now it's, now it's Europe. It seems there is a little bit of a similar procedure that happened in the 2008 crisis. America sneezed, and we did catch cold as Europeans, although we had all these um, uh, theories about the the uh, decoupling. And uh, you can see, we can perfectly see how Europe is an uh, economic uh, unit. 
We could have solved a very, very difficult situation with Greece and with other countries. We somehow solved it without either Euro or uh, European Union falling apart, but we're not a health union. Uh, we had to create that really, really fast. It was, it was a um, mechanism that didn't exist. Um, and it's a it's little bit hard to judge um, how to compare a country's reaction to uh, a European Union's reaction because there the situation is very much, uh, very much complicated. So uh, I, I take it as a big, uh, big advantage that European Union didn't break down. It uh, was a very severe test. And um, in the beginning, it did look it did look like it because in the beginning, where we had the first blow, our borders closed. We started reacting. It looked like there was no European Union in the first two three weeks of the um, of the uh, breakdown of the pandemic. So um, uh, let me just uh, conclude that uh, maybe in the future. And this is a bold thought. It will not be the economic logic that will perhaps act as a key integral part of uniting not just European countries, but the worldly countries. But it could well be a system of uh, health care. What uh, went extremely wrong in this pandemic was um, lies and deceits and stigmatization of countries and also uh, the inability to react quickly uh, for the outbreak. If in the future we will be able to have a global monitoring system which will destigmatize an outbreak of a pandemic, this could turn out to be more useful and also perhaps more integrating than just uh, applying the economic logic, which of course has been the main engine of European integration um, uh, after the Second World War was the, the make, make trade not love. So, uh, uh, so with that, I will conclude my uh, <laughs> uh, introductory remarks. Thank you, Tomasz. Uh, okay, this is the state of affairs and the current state of affairs, and I, I would, uh, I would think that there was, you know, a considerable degree of consensus uh, yeah. uh, among uh, the the panelists and. Uh, uh, and now the question is, uh, lessons learned, how do we, where do we go from here? And as always in these situations, in every crisis of the European uh, uh, Union and integration, some people will say that the difficulties stem from the fact that the EU is insufficiently integrated, or too much, yeah. that we should go for more integration, that we should have uh, centralized European healthcare system and, uh, and uh, public health system, etc., etc. And others will claim that uh, uh, the problem stem from the fact that the EU is trying to meddle in problems that are better left to uh, uh, member states, that are uh, better left to the lower level. And I think one lesson that is already emerging in, in what I read from, from analysts about the crisis is, is the factor that we usually don't consider in, in macro-political thinking, uh, the factor of speed. The speed was at a premium. I mean, it was not uh, to do it about doing it perfectly, it was about doing it quickly. Mm -hmm. As and quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. And whoever did it faster yeah. uh, uh, benefited in, 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 in the end, despite uh, uh, all the problems. And uh, one thing that I think we would agree about Europe on is that whatever its great advantages, and there are great advantages to the European integration, it was not built for speed. And, uh, and uh, we are now in the run-up to the conference on the European future. And, uh, and I think that it would be a missed opportunity if we did not uh, consider uh, how to make uh, uh, the decision-making 
on the European level and on the national level and on the local level, how to make it uh, more efficient, faster, quicker, uh, econ more economic. Uh, would, you, would you agree with that? Yes, yeah. it's me. Oh, look, uh, I think one of the, the problems we have to face here is, and sometimes you forget, we, we forget it. It's the, if you consider that there are 27 countries in, uh, in Europe, and you look, for example, to external relations. For example, look to Russia. I understand perfectly that uh, Central and Eastern countries in Europe have a different feelings towards Russia that had the ones on the West, because historically for us in the West, I mean, the West is passing the, passing the other or passing the, uh, the Rhine, depending on what you look at Germany. Uh, the Russians only came twice here, one, and always after people that have invaded them. First time they came after Napoleon, second time they came after Hitler. And of course, with communism, they occupied and they oppressed uh, Eastern Europe. But nowadays, well, look, people in the West, I mean, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, we don't think that Russians are threatening us. We are not going to, to feel that because historically we have no reasons for that. And, and so the perception of, look, another problem where Europe is split and divided is United States and China are engaging in something that you can call it uh, the start of a new Cold War or not. Anyway, there is, even if you don't call it Cold War, call it competition, what you want. But anyway, it's something that is going to be in the next next years, we are going to, in Europe, to, to have to face and to take sides. And of course, taking sides is completely different for depending on countries, depending on, because during the Cold War, for example, there was a clear ideological split between what you can call the, the West or the uh, democracies or freedom and uh, communism, the, the Eastern, Eastern Bloc. Nowadays, it depends on, on uh, because, well, Chinese don't want to, to use or to have uh, a total, uh, parties, pro-China parties in our countries. They have interests, normally. They have interests, they act uh, through their, those interests, through companies, through people that work for them. But it, it's completely different. So, uh, always, Europe has to take sides on this, has to decide things on this. And uh, of course, it's completely different. For example, Germany sells a lot of automobiles to China. Uh, Germany has very important, deep interests with China. Portugal nowadays has some, also some, some interests and some connections with China, but other countries maybe have not. And, they, and so it's, it's, it's extremely different, difficult to, to take sides or, or to and, and just to finish, when you have a group of people, because we are, we are talking now in terms of speed, speed to, for vaccination, speed to take decisions on healthcare, that sort of things. When you have a, not discipline in a group of 27 or a group of 10, or, uh, if you have not a discipline of March, of course, the, 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 the speed is the speed of the, the one that takes more time to do things is the, the speed of the slower one. And that also is a, a serious problem, I guess. Yeah, well, I was afraid we would get into geopolitics. Uh, it happened sooner than I expected, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's fine. Yeah, I would uh, return a little bit uh, back to your question. Um, biggest problem was that uh, right now, Schengen system basically doesn't exist. That's true. 
as Tomáš mentioned, uh, closing of borders. It is reality right now, or it was reality, because uh, we can't uh, travel to Portugal without test, without quarantine. We even uh, are, weren't not able to travel to Germany at all. Couple of weeks, yeah. Well, sort of Prague was impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. And right now we are not able going to Italy without uh, five days of quarantine, and uh, it's similar in any other countries. If you are traveling around Europe, there are again border controls on the ground, yeah. Not only on the airports, but on the grounds, Austrian German borders, uh, Slovenian Austrian borders. That's reality. And I think Portugal that... Portugal and Spain also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the same. And uh, I, I see uh, this uh, state of uh, affairs uh, quite, uh, quite alarming, yeah, because that's some kind, you know, of uh, covid -phobia, yeah, because we are closing each other against uh, each mm. other, and that's, uh, it uh, wasn't good uh, results of uh, European, let's say, demos in the COVID crisis, because, you know, uh, there are and there were huge differences uh, among um, infection level around Europe, uh, and uh, especially in our country, we have been a really deep covidarium quite a couple of weeks, and I absolutely understand uh, other countries that they were afra afraid of us. Same Portugal, as far as I remember, in February, there were also uh, quite high level of inf infection, but uh, uh, it's, uh, for me, some sign that uh, deeper integration is not a solution for uh, these problems which uh, we are seeing uh, right now in Europe. And also, some comparison. For example, in uh, sovereign countries, as Switzerland, for example, or United States, they, they, uh, there were uh, quite uh, different approaches among uh, states in the United States and also uh, among cantons in Switzerland or even regions, for example, in Spain. Yeah. We have seen completely different approach of, 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 to the pandemics in Madrid or Catalonia. Yeah. And uh, I think that uh, those problems are uh, even internal pro pro problems in uh, concrete countries. For example, on the start of epidemics uh, in uh, northern Italy, there were some parts of um, Lombardy or uh, Veneto, uh, which were uh, in really uh, huge hospital crisis, for uh, example, Bergamo and um, some uh, a couple of kilometers nearby in Verona, they were completely, uh, no completely, but they were, there were empty hospital beds. Same in France. There were, as you probably remember, in uh, a year ago, there were a huge crisis in uh, North France uh, and in Paris. Uh, intensive care units were completely crowded. And on south of France, uh, till uh, maybe May, there were only 100 uh, examples of infection at all. And French people were not able, French government and, and French officials, to move patients from Paris, to example, to Nice, Marseille, Bordeaux. Yeah, I think that this problem is in, no in uh, integration and all these processes, but it's in mind and flexibility and, as you mentioned, speed. And there are huge uh, topics for discussion. It's, for, for me, it's a lesson from pandemics. Yes, well, it's, it's certainly true that, you know, some of the problems were perhaps the easiest to deal with on, on the local level. But I would not exaggerate the problems of the Schengen system. I mean, there's always been provisions in the system for suspending it yeah, in, in emergencies and you know we should Lenka we should keep in mind that until quite recently we had border controls between individual districts in this country yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, so that, that's could, right in Portugal it was same by the way uh, as far yeah, as I yeah. remember so you couldn't yeah. travel to the next town We're let still. alone the next country so uh, next village in yeah. Prague yeah it's uh, uh, you know, one of the lessons learned for me was that we, uh, like it or not, uh, have 
forced to accept things we never thought we would accept uh, in, uh, yeah. in, 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 in normal world, but this is not normal world. Uh, frankly, I think you have to wait a little to let the dust to settle, yeah. because really, really, we don't know exactly now which uh, the different ways the different authorities lead, uh, deal with the, the, the pandemic was really the better. Uh, we know that uh, going fast was good, but sometimes going fast was not best way because they they also make uh, some great mistakes and uh, we have uh, wonderful health systems that collapse and we have uh, lousy health systems that did well we have uh, integrated well uh, health systems that uh, could work and we have uh, integrated well systems that didn't work it's very very difficult to say exactly what uh, what happened because even now we don't know a lot of things about uh, uh, the way the, the virus work so and the very the, the way the virus is so dangerous to the elderly people and uh, almost uh, doesn't do anything to the the child and, and there are a lot of mystery in the, uh, till this moment so i don't think that we ha have to take uh, lessons about uh, to integrate, for instance, the healthcare system at the European level. I, I know every time that there are crises, there are this temptation at the, uh, in Europe to integrate, integrate, integrate. And uh, we now see that some of those movements have created more problems than, than, uh, than solve uh, those, uh, those problems. And uh, sometimes a kind of laws, laws integration is better than the uh, hard uh, uh, integrations. And uh, um, I think the experience of the, the Eurozone is perhaps the, the better one uh, if you compare with the time and we have almost a year without a year, we have a kind of, uh, without a hard currency, but something very similar. It was perhaps not so easy to manage because you have still have different currencies, but uh, the, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to discuss that, but it's it was times where there are some space for the different governments to have some flexibility that they lose and then we have the credit something that we have discussed a lot in Portugal of course now it's impossible to come to, come, to go back so it's very very difficult to 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 uh, when you go to go forward to come back which is to have to be kept very carefully at, at uh, these moments. And uh, when you think of healthcare and we think, and you, you think of the different systems you have in Europe, be careful because you have very, very different systems in Europe when you think of healthcare. The, the system in Portugal is completely different of the, the for instance, the German system, uh, the kind of the the way people assess the, the healthcare. Of course, it's health for everybody, but the way we finance the system, the way we pay for our health, the way people wait for the, the public service to be, uh, it's completely different. So it's, there are different cultures. Uh, so I will be uh, a little more careful and mostly because of something I say in my uh, first intervention is the problem of accountability of the European institutions and I think we don't have enough now and the more things we do to put more power in the institutions that are without accountability more of a democratic problem we have and more uh, we can have a problem and it's not only a question 
of speed because if we think a little the which is the best systems to have lots of speed it's a dictatorship dictatorship is the best speed to have the best systems to have speed and so china was very efficient efficient in this crisis they have a system where everything goes top down and is very efficient do you want to have this system I don't think so. I don't no. think so. No. <laughs> no I'm not even not. convinced that this system was so efficient. I, I, yeah. I, I, I prefer <laughs> some, some risk. The risk of some, uh, some health risks <laughs> or a system yeah. of that. Tom. Yeah, I, I very much agree with Professor Fernandez. I think we also have to wait for the dust to settle because um, the vaccination story is just one part of the story and if we want to compare European Union with other integral parts and the speed of the reaction, reaction, China has had epidemics before, United States of America has had epidemics before, India has had epidemics before, there, there are institutions and structures that have some memory. European Union has learned this uh, on the go, learning, learning by doing. Migration crisis was the same, same, same system, same problem. Uh, let's say the Greek crisis or the financial crisis was much more difficult for us to deal with because it was really a, a, a first occurrence of this. I believe next time it will look completely different and then we can compare. But when, we're talking about, <laughs> when we are talking about comparison, compare European Union with uh, World Health Organization. I mean, there we could have a long debate whether the World Health Organization uh, didn't actually utter completely misleading and wrong information right from the beginning, which is something that actually didn't happen. So if I, if I could compare the responsible organization for dealing with this, which should have been World Health Organization, yep. not European Union, sure. same, same thing happened during the migration crisis. Why wasn't the UN blamed for mishandling? what other institution than UN uh, should be dealing with, uh, uh, let's say, civil war situation in the vicinity of Europe. Uh, let's also compare uh, the European Union to Russia, uh, which is, of course, a very big topic here in Czech Republic uh, since, since Saturday. But even if you compare it with excellent countries that we like to be compared with, for example, Switzerland that you've already mentioned here. Switzerland is a small country. It's a very clockwork orange country. It's a country that you know works maybe even more precisely than Germany. And yet, uh, even Czech Republic is ahead according to the last uh, our world in data, our world in data um, numbers. It's it's even behind Czech Czech Republic. Uh, so it, in, in the number of vaccinated vaccination, people. Vaccination, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they started yeah. quite... Uh, yeah. Quite late uh, and yeah, not doing, late, doing yeah. worse jobs than, than we are. And the same goes for yeah, Norway. But they are not using AstraZeneca at all. Yeah, 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 Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the reason, yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, and, and also, let me, let me actually... The whole thing that I want to say is that it's a small step for EU, but it's a big step for the world. We mustn't forget that this uh, idea of, of integrating and working together and actually having a common, a common enemy, which is something we were always hoping for, sort of in uh, our bachelor years on how to unite an entity, is always good to have some sort of a external or create an internal enemy. Now the whole world is going uh, in, in, in this direction of, of, of realizing for the first time maybe in this history of this beautiful blue planet that we are all suffering from same ignorance, we're all suffering from same bureaucratic uh, and political <laughs> and economic problems. And let me, let me, let me conclude with, there really, I mean, yeah, as, as, as we heard from Professor Fernandez, totalitarian regimes would be really good at this, uh, intuitively. And uh, there wasn't really a debate on for example, when we now talk about vaccination, which again, we shouldn't be derail, der, derailed by that. As I said, it's a merry-go-round. Two, three months ago, it looked like Europe is doing pretty well and we were all laughing at the United States. In the beginning, it looked like Czech Republic uh, uh, is the champion a uh, year back. And then we ended up at, 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 at the very tail of the bottom of the pit. 
<laughs> now they're in, in the, the, the spike is turning up in India again. So it's, 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 it's really too early to say, but philosophically speaking, uh, there was not even a debate on solving this sort of the extreme right way. No, there is no market solution to this problem, even the most adherent Trump-like uh, Tea Party, extreme Republican American right wing didn't come up with any viable market-driven solution, point number one. And point number two, the vaccination distribution was interestingly never even debated that the rich and the powerful should get it first. It was always pretty much everywhere. Yeah, of course we give it to the weakest, which is pensioners. And sorry to say from a purely economic point of view, and now I'm speaking as, 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 a, as an economic um, <laughs> fuck idiot, uh, we should firstly, of course, vaccinate the strong and the powerful and, and the rich and the famous and those who are actually creating economic value. We don't need the pensioners. So this idea that it wasn't even debated and that we automatically in every country gave it first to the weakest, that I think is a European idea. Well, I am so happy, Tomáš, that your son in nature never fails you. And my what? <laughs> your son in nature. Oh, yeah, okay. I get that a lot. I get that a lot. Sometimes I get so depressed I read my own articles to feel better. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, but that uh, is my role here, no? You should be negative as we put Like Mr. Cho and Lai said when they asked him about what he thought of the French Revolution, he said, it's too early to tell. So uh, <laughs> this is uh, your point about, uh, about, about the pandemics. But unfortunately, we have time for one last round only. And since they are uh, all economically thinking people, Uh, on this panel, I, I, I would pose my last question in more or less economic terms. I mean, it seems we're not sure, but it seems we are now emerging out of the tunnel and there will be a huge question of priorities. What should the priorities be in limited time mm. with limited funds and Uh, should it be the Green Deal? Uh, should it be uh, uh, inequality? Uh, should it be climate change? Should the uh, uh, reconstruction be investment driven and uh, uh, growth driven? Or should uh, we also think about austerity in, in some respects? Uh, I think this will decide uh, yeah. uh, how do we look See, too back early at to this. Tell. <laughs> 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 too early. Well, tell. this is an yeah. economist yeah. for you, you know what? <laughs> Forecasters, yeah, even. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> Professor, can you be more specific? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's not easy to <laughs> predict the future. To answer that because, uh, well, of course. Ideally, but we, we, we always that those monies, those monies, are, are, in some sense, are easy monies, and governments will will want to take uh, well, to take advantage of it, distributing. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the problem is that all this, all these uh, funds, all these resources. Uh, they will be object of, of, of uh, competition between governments, between uh, opposition, between among uh, uh, business and, uh, well, people see that and um, a rational that come from the center, for a center in sense of the, the, the Union, the European Union, I don't know if, they, if it, it will be wise to do that because it depends on the on the, it, each country or each uh, has, has its own problems and uh, its different uh, culture identity. For example, in Portugal, I, I was listening to uh, your, your description of the problems inside the internal problems in Italy or in France. We, it's very curious because as far as we are in a very old national state, We had not this problem, this kind of problems we have not. Thanks God, we have not, we have not. And I think 
in some sense is one of the our our best uh, uh, things that we have in Portugal is exactly that we are a, we are an extremely united and identity country in that sense because we have no I'd say we have not fragmentation fragmentation uh, in terms of uh, uh, religion, in terms of cultures, in terms, in that sense, we are really a national unit. But of course, we have other, other, other serious problems. And uh, uh, we see after I, I, I wrote a book last year. I, thanks to confinement, I had time to wrote a book about epidemics and pandemic. And it's very curious because. At the end of the day, even with the progress, uh, science, technology, everything, people get extremely, in panic, people get extremely, the reactions are the same. Is before people put the blame on God or on gods or uh, anyway, nowadays people is, are very surprised because science uh, is not giving immediately the answers. People, when we look at this mess in the beginning in the hospitals in Northern Italy, in one of the most sophisticated and uh, civilized areas of the, the world, and suddenly, and, and it's very curious because this impact, uh, I read a lot of descriptions of people uh, with the Black Death or some, and it's, the, the, the problem is that human nature, as it does not change, emerges uh, as the same as if you had not going through centuries of, uh, uh, I'd say, science and progress and technology and all those things. And suddenly people are in panic. People uh, will do everything to survive. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, I, I don't know what, so the moment it arrives, these uh, resources, these funds, uh, people will look at it as some kind of magic treasury and will try to to take it. It's uh, in that sense, I don't I don't believe that there, there will be a lot of rational discussions about that. People, it will be political. It will be inspired by uh, by political forces and well, of course, competing competing as they normally do. And uh, well, in that sense, I'm. And extremely pessimistic about human yes. nature. Well, uh, and but... I'm very pessimistic about the time we have left. We have five minutes, <laughs> yeah. so I will okay. have to squeeze the three of you in. Lenka, speak fast. Yeah, I will be fast. So, uh, lesson learned uh, from this crisis. We have seen a very functioning uh, private business in this crisis. Shops uh, were full of uh, stuff, uh, everything works, uh, all this e-commerce and this kind of stuff. It was the reason why uh, ordinary life of people was quite comfortable during this crisis. And there were huge fears um, on the start of pandemics, if you remember. For example, I was uh, really horrified by these uh, pictures from British supermarkets all these uh, people with full uh, baskets of toilet paper and uh, onion and this kind of stuff. Uh, and this uh, shopping run. And uh, in, uh, in a while, everything functioning uh, very properly. On the other hand, there was, according to me, crisis of bureaucracy, all these state systems. And I think that the lesson learned is that uh, state should be much more smaller much more thinner and better functioning, much more, uh, no, as companies, because here in the Czech Republic, we had really bad experience with this kind of uh, governing, uh, but this lesson learned for me. Yes, and we will skip our government. Uh, Jose Manuel, please. <laughs> <laughs> At all. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I would like that the, all the money could go to the to the innovation business, and that uh, it would be possible uh, that uh, we could take take apart the, the the European bureaucracy and the national bureaucracy from the 
from the way, which is very, very difficult because uh, everybody <laughs> is afraid of uh, corruption. Everybody is afraid that uh, the money is going to the to to to, to the the wrong ends, and so it takes a lot of time to 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 get to the field and uh, a lot of a lot of criteria, and uh, sometimes it does it does to have to the to the right places. Uh, it's not perhaps the best way to to finance uh, a rebound, but uh, it's the it's the way we ha we have. Let's let's see if 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 it works. Uh, unfortunately, in Portugal, most of the the money that comes goes to finance the public affairs. Uh, it's very thin part will go to the private sector. So. Uh, we hope at least that the state spend its uh, the well uh, spend what uh, and invests the best way possible i don't have a lot of expert a lot uh, of hope but let's see thank you and uh, tomas the last famous words go to you yeah the question was how to get the economy back on feed what to do i would actually let it B for a while, less of fair. I'm thinking yeah, there have been so okay. many changes. For one year, we could actually not do anything. I think there's so much That's energy, yeah. <laughs> so much energy yeah. in the economy <laughs> waiting. And then austerity. Mm -hmm. This is how conservative the I am. Has yeah, to be yeah, 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 so, yeah. Yeah. Just, so everybody yeah. agree with the yeah. final words. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I can yeah. now go yeah. and have a beer. Yeah. These are <laughs> our famous last words, but uh, it is for me now to thank you all to thank Professor Jaime Noguera Pinto and it's a great, thank pleasure. You. Great pleasure and to Jose be Manuel here. Fernandez. Thank you. It was great, actually. I, 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 I learned a lot. Uh, and thank you, Lenka Zlamalova. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Tomáš Sedláček. And before we go, we have uh, uh, my partner in crime, uh, Ambassador <laughs> Luz de Maido <laughs> Samper. <laughs> and he will conclude this. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was uh, a remarkable panel, a very interesting discussion. I have to thank you very much for the commitment to this debate. Very different in nature from the first panel. Really? In the yeah. first panel, we heard things like Europe is our destiny. <laughs> we were very committed in that sense. You sounded a little bit more sceptical about our common future, but it was a remarkably interesting, thoughtful, and insightful discussion. So both to our Portuguese participants in the panel and uh, my good friends, and also to the Czech participants here in Prague, and a special thank to the Václav Havel Library Amen. Foundation, to my friend, uh, Mikhail uh, Zentovsky, and let me tell you that uh, one of the interesting takeaways of the debate today, this is a demonstration how for medium-sized European Union member nations like Good. Portugal no. and, Czech and the Czech Republic, exactly. it is important to hold the presidency of the European Council. We have uh, yeah. at least the hope that we could mark a little bit the agenda yeah. as we try to do today. And let me also tell you that on the 5th of May, we are going to have the next conference of the cycle that our embassy is promoting here in the Czech Republic, and this time devoted to the strategic value of language and culture. Great. And of course, Great. a special focus on the Portuguese language. My okay. friends, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Yes. Bye bye. To Lisbon. Thank you. Bye bye. Enjoy the spring. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>